welcome everyone. I'm Nancy Addison with Organic Healthy Life. And I am so thrilled today to be having a conversation with Barb Webb, who is the owner and editor of a popular blog, Rural, Rural, <laughs> Rural Mom and columnist for She Savvy. She's a blog partner for the dailymeal.com and Taste of Home blogger. And she's a Better Homes and Business Pro. And she lives with her husband and three children. And she has a new grandchild. I don't know if they all live there, but um, she has chickens and a big old garden. And she has a new book out called Getting Baked, Everything You Need to Know About Hemp, CBD, and Medicinal Gardening. And she is going to share some of her brilliance with us today on gardening, ways you can put plants around your home that will help prevent like mosquitoes or snakes, uh, but also be healthy types of plants to have around you as well as being beautiful and ones that you could probably cook with. So welcome Barbara. It's so nice to connect with you again. Thank you. You are so kind. I love you, Nancy. <laughs> um, I, I am so honored to be back on your show. I had a, a brilliant time last time, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you. Well, and introduce us to your friend who's sitting behind you. This is Harley Quinn. <laughs> she is our <laughs> tortie cat. I have several cats, but she has decided to join us today, and there's no persuading her not to. So that's all right. Maybe she'll have something vital to add to the conversation. She does like catnip, which, which is good for chasing mosquitoes away. Absolutely. So. <laughs> uh, I, I just, and I, I hadn't told you this, Barb, but I just released a book last week, which is a new kind of book for me. It's actually a coloring book for children that is, <laughs> it's art therapy and it's for children who are grieving the loss of a beloved pet. Oh, that is fantastic to release the book. And what a what a great topic and what a great therapy for children. I um it's very difficult, I think, for an adult and especially a child, as as we've experienced on the farm with multiple pets and our sons grieving right. through the loss along with us. So wow, I will have to keep an eye out for that. What a great Thank gift to give somebody who has lost a pet too. Thank you. Uh it's called For the Love of Willie. And it's about a squirrel I rehabbed down in Costa Rica. <laughs> and I had Aww. to give him up. <laughs> so, anyway, but I know you have a multitude of lovely creatures at your place of all, all different types. Uh, but today we're going to talk about medicinal gardening. And I'm, I'm so excited for you to share this with us. Fantastic. I'm ready to talk on any subject you want. I think we... Uh, you started uh, pests. We're going to talk about how to get rid of those. <laughs> I think that is a great bugs. place to start, especially, you know, planting things around your patio or where you spend some time in, in, the, in the day outside. Because I know a lot of people really struggle with uh, mosquitoes and things like that. Absolutely. So I think the, the first thing we need to address uh, when we talk about plants and uh, getting rid of unwanted bugs, because of course there's a lot of wanted bugs that we want in our gardens to help grow our greens, um, is no one plant by itself, or even if you planted 50 of them, is necessarily going to repel the bugs. It's one piece of the puzzle because of course we have to get the essential oils out of the plant and um, use it in that manner as we really want to use it as a repellent. Um, so one of the best tips that I always give everybody, that like the number one advice is obviously as we're watering things is not to leave standing water anywhere around your home. If you really wanna get rid of mosquitoes, that's like the number one step to take before we address the plant situation. Um, you know, so that's, as we move in, I think a couple caveats to think that there's there's not a, a foolproof solution, but there are some great things that you can do. So, so Barb, do you have like a, a bird water feeder, you know, like a bird bath or, or things like that? Do you use one of those little wigglers or do you use any of those mosquito donut things that they sell at some of the bird, the bird feed shops? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, actually. Um, so we don't have a bird waterer because we have a natural creek that runs through our property. And so that feeds all of the wildlife in the area. And um, it's away from our home. So that makes life a little bit easier. But when we did have standing water, like in ponds, uh, for example, we've had a few over the years. We have used various um, organic donuts for mosquitoes that would naturally repel, repel or We've often planted around the pond. And so that's when we move into the plant arena of what's great to put around those batches or areas of standing water that would be a mosquito deterrent uh, to even keep them from coming there to think of it as a still pool to lay in. Uh, fish, of course, are really great too. If you, if you can get fish into your natural deterrent, they'll eat the mosquitoes or the larvae as they're, they're attempting to grow. So there's many of organic methods that you can use. Um, what some of the, the donut products are nice. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, one of the things I, I learned way back was that if water is still, that's when they lay the egg. So if there's like a drip in it, uh, and I know that some of these stores sell like a dripper. <laughs> and, yes. and if you have the water moving at all, which is what the little wiggler does, um, then the, the mosquitoes won't lay their eggs there. And so you don't have this huge propagation of mosquitoes uh, continually growing around you. <laughs> Absolutely. Or even a small fountain, you know, which they sell at reasonable cost, $20 or so you can put into a bird bath or even a small pond, uh, up to, upwards to a hundred to put one in a pond, but that's also a good solution. Well, and I, I do recommend, uh, I'm a certified international wildlife rehabilitator, and I really do recommend having some sort of water source outside for your wild animals, because especially here in Texas in the summer, and it is really hot right now here, and they really need water. And um, that would be a really good thing to do. And then using something that prevents mosquitoes from breeding in it would be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it, we, we want mosquitoes, they're pet, part of the natural order of life, right? But uh, we don't want them in bulk in our backyard. <laughs> so what, what are some of your favorite plants to recommend to everyone to plant around their patio? So um, one of the best plants is uh, citronella grass or lemongrass, either one of those, uh, which have high contents of citronella, which we're used to hearing about in organic products, organic bug sprays, um, candles, things of that nature. And it, it, they really obviously are proven to repel mosquitoes. And those two grasses don't necessarily, uh, they exude citronella. So it's not like you have to go up and rub them to, to produce the scent. So that's a great thing to plant around your ponds or even around your deck. Interestingly, lemongrass also repels snakes. So it's, it's kind of just a great plant to have in your landscape. Uh, I want everyone to hear that. Repeat that one, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> really, everyone listen. Tell them what that does again. Yes, so um, lemongrass. I mean, Barb, I apologize. Oh, yeah. No, that's okay. I, <laughs> I've been called worse. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> um lemongrass repels both mosquitoes and snakes so uh it's, snakes. it's definitely snakes. Hear that? Yes. snakes yes and here in texas where we have a multitude of poisonous snakes um yes. that really caught my my attention <laughs> when you said that <laughs> great thing to have in your landscape and it's beautiful so lemongrass is a, a nice tall grass a great accent uh, for around any of your plants that you are growing a good backdrop to them so it's excellent easy to work into your landscape anywhere and it looks great around a pond of course it's that whole tall grass tall reed um quite I think look beautiful yeah so that's a tall one so what are some shorter ones you might you might want to put in front of those. Um, excellent question. So most, um, 
Yeah, and unfortunately, most uh, herbs are going to grow in some height, but um, bee balm, I would say, lemon balm, mint are not going, they're going to crawl, so they'll, they'll spread out a bit and not be as high. Mint in particular does take over your landscape, so it's great for something to plant around a pond or a field where you, you can control that particular area. You don't want to put it in your garden or necessarily your landscape in front of the house because it's going to be invasive and take over, but you could put it in pots and contain it. And I, mint I is, tell and, you, yeah. I, I, have to say, <laughs> I had two little mint plants, two little mint plants I put out in my garden, not knowing that it spreads and nope. um, it gave me nightmares. I, I mean, it took over. I had two acres, and I was up at night worrying about how I'm how I'm going to get the mint out of there. And so, I highly recommend y'all put it in pots. <laughs> yeah, definitely, or if you have a contained <laughs> a contained space where it can't spread. So most definitely, but the, the nice thing about mint and the reason you want to put it in pots or, or try to incorporate it in some way in a contained area is it repels just about everything, including mice, mosquitoes, flies. Uh, it is a natural, it's, it's one of the best. Um, and so if you're worried about the invasive nature of mint, a recommendation I use, and I use this quite often for my um, tomato plants where I seem to have ant problems uh, on a regular basis. I will soak cotton balls in peppermint oil and put them by my tomatoes. So therefore I'm not worrying about the plant invading the space, but the scent of peppermint repels ants like you wouldn't believe. It's actually an, an incredible deterrent. So uh, just soaking a cotton ball with the essential oil of the mint plants, it, peppermint in particular is very strong scent, so it works very well. Is that another is brilliant. method you can I have, use. I love that idea, and I, I, um, I when I, I'm a wildlife rehabilitator, and I would have to put out food for some of my wild animals. A couple of them are blind, so I never knew when they were going to go eat. And also, you know, rats would want to come and eat their food and things, and so I would put well with the ants. I'd put their food in a dish of water, you know, like in a bowl, but then in a dish of water, mm -hmm. not so the food would get wet, but, you know, like in a pie plate or something. And ants can't swim. So it would keep the ants out of the food, but to keep the rats out, I would use peppermint oil and I would dribble it around their, in, uh, their enclosure. And I'd have to do it, you know, maybe once a month or you know, depending right. on the rain or the weather, but it it's really quite remarkable how powerful that is because it rats follow their scent. They kind right. of go to the bathroom everywhere they run. It's kind of gross, but that's they follow that trail of of the urine smell. And if you cut that off with the essential oil, it's it's so powerful. And then they just they go back the other way. Mm -hmm. um, but you have so much brilliant information. <laughs> I love the cotton ball uh, thing by, by your plants. That, yeah, that's that works great. really well. And great. it definitely gets rid of ants, repels them straight out of there. Uh, nature is, is wonderful <laughs> and it's magnificent. But yet then the mint doesn't invade your garden if you do that. And of course, yes, you have to replace them every time it rains heavily uh, because, you know, it will just that's made it out of the cotton ball and it doesn't hurt your plants. Uh, it's just a great organic way uh, to use that. So I love that you have a similar story with destroying rats because mint is incredible. Yes, with, with mice, rats, any type of rodent or bug, uh, just a, a great repellent. So even um, old wives tales, but you know, rubbing mint on your skin, if you're going out in the garden and worried about some bugs, just take a few mint leaves and you know, just kind of rub the essential oil on your skins can help repel some of those good. little, <laughs> you will smell great. Yes. <laughs> well, I love that idea. And I, that's the first time I have ever heard anything like that. 
And I had no idea that mint was such a great repellent for even flies. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would want to put those around my stables or around anywhere where you have animals, especially in the heat of the summer. Absolutely. And, you know, the key is that, again, we're talking essential oils. So the key is we have to release that from the plant. So again, you know, just putting the plant itself will be a help and a deterrent. But when you have the essential oils concentrated and uh, perhaps you even want to um, put little jars of um, peppermint oil out and about around the stable, because that concentrated oil is really going to do the trick even much better than the plant itself growing around there. So as you say that, I wonder, I mean, maybe we could do like a peppermint oil kind of rub on some of your animals that have particularly bad, uh, you know, I wonder if you have to like, you know, put, mix it with anything so it's not too strong or uh, you certainly would have want to avoid their eyes uh, or their, their right. mouth. But that's a really interesting question. I'm going to have to do some research on that. And I would think it would be just as if I, I, I make my own uh, bug repellent. I have the recipe actually in the new book, uh, Getting Baked, as we talk about medicinal gardening. And I did put my personal recipe for bug spray. Oh, you know, water as a dilute. Because um, obviously, yes, you don't even want to, you know, it's, it's fine to rub a mint leaf on your skin, but a very concentrated essential oil as you know, I'm sure, uh, but uh, listeners may not, can actually have consequences uh, when used directly. So you often dilute it with water or another base. Oil. Now, do, a, do a test on mm -hmm. one tiny little spot and see how you do. Um, but tell us more about your fabulous book. <laughs> um, so in the book, we talk a lot about medicinal gardening, and I added a section in there for first aid because there, um, there are so many properties of herbs and spices that we're using in medicinal ways that can be used topically, and obviously uh, preventing bugs or relieving itches uh, is a good one. And also um, in there, actually my first book, which is Getting Laid, <laughs> Everything You Need to Know About uh, Chickens Gardening, and preserving, I talk a lot about um, companion plants too, because as we're talking about insects, you're not just uh, worried about yourself necessarily. If you're growing a garden, you have to worry about preventing insect damage to your garden too. So there are a lot of companion herbs um, that would be excellent. For example, sage gets rid of cabbage moths. So you would want to plant sage in, interspersed with your cabbage if you're having that type of problem on your property. So these herbs and, and spices, not just good for humans, but also good for what we're growing as produce and human consumption. And then of course we have lovely sage, which can be used as a hair rinse. Um, you know, you can even put sage in your lotions. It has many medicinal properties topically as well as ingesting it. So oh, the book I covers a lot of that. It's, it's, it's a whole, seed to lifestyle uh, book. I, I love that. And um, this, is, this is something that's very near and dear to my heart. And I know so many people today are trying to start their own gardens because there's such an unpredictability about what's going on in the world. And you, you hear things about you know, not being able to have access to certain types of food or are, are different things here and there depending on where you are in the world and so I think I've, I've really highly recommended people try to get some of their own organic seeds and start their own garden and you know your book would be a really great resource for them. Thank you so interesting I was reading a study um, yesterday that there is a shortage in nurseries right now because gardening is so popular in the COVID era where it was us diehard gardeners <laughs> who were predominantly clients of the nurseries. Now, um, you know, younger kids, uh, millennials, if you want to categorize different uh, categories there, but the, the 20 to, to 30 year old age group who wasn't so interested in planting is now and they're looking for 
uh, indoor plants as well as outdoor because many of them live in apartments. So the nurseries are experiencing major shortage in tree growth or, or plants in general. Um, so learning to plant from seed is going to be a skill I think that most people need to get on board with at this point <laughs> because commercially they can't keep up with our demands. And it's not as tricky as you think, especially when you're talking about herbs and spices, as I'm sure you know, Nancy, most of them are, are really prolific and so easy to grow and nurture from seed. Yes, and I, you know, I think just nurturing the, the seed is so much fun. I love seeing that little, that little sprout come up out of the soil and, uh, and yeah, it, they're, uh, I have a real affinity for plants ever since I read the Secret Life of Plants many years ago that is scientifically based, but it totally changed the way I looked at life in general. And I never looked at plants the same way again. And uh, yeah, I, I realized that they are conscious beings. And, uh, and so I, I do treat them with reverence. Oh, absolutely. They respond to touch. They respond to voice. And how cool is it? Yeah, you know, just to coax that little seed into life. And then before you know it, it's producing just wonderful, you know, amazing substances for us to consume or use uh, to support our needs uh, nutritionally or medically or, or anything else that we happen to be doing. Or even just aesthetically, flowers, landscaping. I mean, is it when you drive past a beautiful house that has beautiful landscaping, you're just kind of like, ah, oh. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's very pleasing in so many ways to all of our senses. Well, I think the new popular way of having uh, anything around your home is not really a lawn that you water that really doesn't provide anything for you except you know, mowing. <laughs> I think the new thing is doing permaculture around your house and actually having it benefit you uh, medicinally and uh, food wise, as well as aesthetically. And, um, and I love that. And I, I think you do a lot of that, don't you? I do. Actually, I tore up our entire front uh, section to do a uh, integrated garden. So it's going to be I left some of the standing flowering plants and especially I've, I've already developed some wild roses in front of my house, which are breathtaking, but also medicinally wonderful. And they decided to use herbs more into my landscaping and integrating it in the way that we're speaking about um, from bug control, you know, repelling ants, repelling mosquitoes from our general vicinity around our home. So we've got lavender, which we haven't talked about yet, which is fantastic mosquito repellent, often used in many natural um, lemongrass, uh, marigolds, which are also a bug repellent, and a deer repellent if you happen to live in the country. Deers do not like, deer do not like the scent of marigolds, so I actually plant them around my garden as well. And any help you can get to keep a deer out of your corner, your beans is a good thing. So there's a lot of different plants, yes, that you can incorporate into your landscape that are just as beautiful as, uh, and there's nothing wrong with an ornamental plant, but they're just as beautiful. And the, the, the fact is an ornamental is good for one thing where an herb or a spice or even a plant like marigold, which is consumable uh, are good for so many more. So it's, it's that, mentality of yes getting more out of our resources and not being so limited by what's out there i i was one of these young moms 30 35 36 years ago and i lived in this area in dallas that was actually designed by the guy that designed beverly hills and so you know everybody had these beautiful lawns and all the landscaping <laughs> and, and, you know, of course I'm the mom who's taking organic gluten-free whole grain sprouted snacks for the class you know <laughs> with, with with no sodas and um uh so I was kind of known as the different kind of mom I was very different back then and uh <laughs> 
So I had rows of corn planted along the back of our our uh, yard and, and uh, had big, I had wild vegetables growing all over the place. And I remember my neighbors were very kind to me because I think they liked my uniqueness. But uh, in my front yard, I had a uh, apple tree, apricot tree and a plum tree. And, uh, and I just thought it was just so much fun, especially for the kids to be able to go out and pick their own fruit off the tree when it was ripe. I just think that is just the ultimate. And <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, you know, dare to be different is what I'm saying to y'all. Um, just because everybody's doing one thing doesn't mean you can't do what you want to do that you think is right. And, and I truly, you know, I really admire you, Barb, because you grew up in the city. And here you're out in the country and you're, you know, you're the power woman out there doing, you know, gardening and chickens and uh, <laughs> home cooking with herbs and, and things. I mean, I just think you're awesome. Well, thanks, Nancy. I think you're awesome, too. I think we would make great neighbors because we sound <laughs> very similar. I think um, as I drive around my neighborhood, I am, I am very different. <laughs> And whether they like it or not, <laughs> we just planted two apple trees out in our front uh, two years ago. And I have, I have beds of garlic in my front lawn, uh, along with some tomatoes and peppers. So I'm growing it right out there for the world to see. Uh, well, now let a lot me know of when the place next yeah. door is for sale. <laughs> yes. <yeah. laughs> that would be great. Uh, you know, so it's, it is, it's, um, we need to rethink a lot of what we're doing for our environment. And, and a lot of people are on board, I think, with the environment, especially as it pertains to global warming, but we need to look at what's going on in our backyard and even our front lawns, uh, you know, as I think we, we may have talked about dandelions are not our enemy. They're our friend. They feed the bees and the butterflies. And we need them. Those are the pollinators. <laughs> Those are the people who keep our produ produce going. You know, even if you don't have a garden, you still want these friendly bugs um, coming to your home. You know, so whether you plant a little pot of lavender for them or keep your dandelions and don't eradicate and put chemicals on your lawn, uh, it's not harming anything. And they're actually quite beautiful when they do go into flower. <laughs> I think you know, I love gorgeous. seeing the lawn speckled. Yes. What's interesting is, uh, and I just interviewed this man last week who uh, had had a near death experience and, and needed to get away and he just needed to. So he, he went and lived in the wild forests of Canada for a year, <laughs> literally, you know, with wow. you know, no money and just off the land. And he said he lived off of the Indy Lions a great deal of the time. And that they were so satisfying and nourishing for him and that he never really felt hungry. And I thought that was really great information. And I've always wondered why these pesticide companies, like, I'm not going to say their name or they'll take me off, but, <laughs> um, you know, why they would target the healthiest plants on the planet <laughs> to poison, <laughs> you know? And so um, I, I, for one, think that weeds are just plants that are not where you want them. And that doesn't mean that they're bad or harmful or anything. They may be some of the healthiest, best plants on the planet. And that's how they've got that strength and they've got that vitality and they've got that survival mode. And I believe when we eat that, that we get that from them, that we absorb that vibrancy and that you know, survival mechanism, you know, that. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, we, as we know, herbs are, are basically weeds. They are very hardy, vibrant plants and we just define them different. And a lot of weeds that we define as weeds actually have incredible medicinal properties and were used I do find it interesting, like when did we as a society, I, I've never researched this, 
you know, decide that moving from prairie to chemically fertilized lawn was a good idea. <laughs> prairie used to be the acceptable beauty and, uh, you know, pre lawnmower. And I can understand wanting to um, I either naturally graze it down with animals because animals thrive off of prairies. Uh, or flattening it around your house so you're not attracting so many bugs and such. Um, but uh, yeah, why why remove the weeds? Because um, well, and here here in Texas, um, something something I I'm I'm a huge environmental enthusiast, and I was married to an environmental trial lawyer for 23 years. So he did a lot of environmental impact studies on water and air and quality and electromagnetic fields. And we were just absolutely aghast, just, you know, horrified at the amount of water it took to like water a lawn or, you know, water a golf course as compared to using it on a farm or having a natural, uh, naturally environmentally sound garden around your home. And so that, that was one of the thoughts I had behind what I did when my kids were growing up is, is I just wasn't going to buy into that wasteful water use, uh, especially here in Texas, where, you know, we've gone through different droughts through, through the years that have been very, very rough. And you do get water rationing. And so I'm, I'm of the mentality of, you know, the permaculture and uh, having the rain barrels and preserving what, what God gives us and not, not being wasteful simply because, you know, everybody in the neighborhood has, you know, this kind of grass or, or whatever it is. And um, so anyway, I, I guess I've been a renegade at heart, heart probably my whole life. <laughs> I generally let the only thing I water are my container plants because they have they have to be watered. Uh, everything else I let nature run its course unless uh, the exception would be if we're in a drought period and I obviously have a vibrant garden going I'm going to try to to nourish it a bit and we also have rain barrels so I'll, I'll typically use that to compensate but nature does tend to do a great job and, and and that's another thing i like to talk to people about um, as you talk about water conservation you know you really have to look to what grows prolifically in your area and how can you best grow it with limited water use so if you live in a very dry climate where tomatoes are not going to do well because they do need a, a good dose of water container plant them so at least you can control how much saturation is going into the container plant rather than having to, um, you know, do it. I, I can't hear you. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Yeah, I just okay. had a cough. <laughs> that was my bad. That's okay. uh, so if you heard that, hopefully um, it was, it was contain those plants in areas where they won't thrive so that you can control the water uses and not be necessarily drowning your garden. Um, if you live in an area where lawn is sparse, consider sedum. Uh, sedum thrives in the heat and makes a beautiful green carpet that also flowers and looks beautiful. I started doing patches of that around our property to fill in uh, some rocky areas. And it's, it's absolutely beautiful and it's prolific and it grows in very little amount of soil, very little amount of water. So there are alternatives to that green grass other than asphalt. Oh, I, I love that. <laughs> I love that idea. Sedum. How do you spell that? S-E-D-U-M. And I believe there's five or six types off the top of my head. Um, don't have that material in front of me because it's, it's not an herb or a spice. I don't have it memorized. But <laughs> um, you can buy actual sedum. Uh, it, yes, it's it's just S-E-D-U-M. Uh, sedum tiles, they sell little square plats at nurseries and you just kind of drop it and water it in and it just takes off in whatever area that you want to. Or you can buy them as individual plants or clippings. If someone else in your neighborhood has 
sedum or any type of it. Uh, again, there's five main varieties, I think maybe six. Um, you can actually take clippings and put that clipping in. You take the leaves off the bottom, uh, about an inch or two, put that clipping in water and it will begin to grow roots. And you can actually then have your plant from that. It's it's so simple. It's it's an amazing plant and it grows. It, it's very prolific. So it will make a nice, beautiful carpet in an area that might be otherwise bare in your landscape. How beautiful. Thank you for that wonderful information. <laughs> Um, here, here in Texas, I knew some people that were uh, like wildlife fans. And when you mow a, a yard, you know, you kill a lot of creatures. Uh, certain bees cannot live in cultivated or monitored land, or especially if they have any kind of poison on it. Um, but also, um, birds and wildlife, frogs, uh, lizards, things like that, they get they get killed. And so they would plant uh, buffalo grass, which gets to a certain height and you don't mow it. And, okay. so, you know, I think, you know, I love lightning bugs and I have to admit, you just don't see lightning bugs in Texas hardly ever. But this year I went to a friend's ranch and I got to see some lightning bugs and I felt like I was on top of the world. I was like, oh, oh my God. I was like, just, just amazing. But um, if we start doing like what you're doing, and going pesticide free and, and, and being more natural, maybe we'll get some of those wonderful creatures back um, uh, in our area and we can, you know, support it and, and make our environment much more richer and thriving. And I think oh, definitely. It's what we all want, isn't it? At least right. I <laughs> well, and, and we're talking about bugs. So if you don't like bugs, why would you not? You would want birds and frogs. And those those creatures eat lots of the invasive bugs that you don't like. Um, another thing, too, I recommend to people, if you have the land space and don't be afraid of them, is to put up a bat house if you're having a mosquito problem, too. Uh, bats eat like, I don't know how many times their weight of mosquitoes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and and it really works. It, we lived uh, before the property that we lived on was uh, bigger than the property we have now. And we had mosquito problems and we put up bat houses and it really took down the population to an incredibly manageable level. So there's just so that. many different. I love different that. Too. Um, my daughter and I went to a bat symposium once and learned about all the health benefits of bats and one of those little bat houses because we got one for under our our eve of our house one of those will hold like a group of 300 mm -hmm. and they you know 300 eating you know 10,000 each mosquitoes a night I mean that's a, a lot um there's a bridge in Austin Texas that has one of the largest bat colonies in the Southwest under it. And it's one of the most popular things in, in town to go do is watch the bats come out at night. It's, it's just absolutely gorgeous. But they did that on purpose. They designed the bottom of the bridge in order to provide this habitat for the bats because they had such a bad mosquito problem at the time. And it solved the problem perfectly without any kind of poison or pesticide. And I wonder why they don't do all the bridges that way. I mean, I've, I've wondered why they, you know, don't do that. Um, but I, I think that's a brilliant idea and suggestion. And those bat houses are only like, I don't know, I think ours was $60 or $75, yeah. something like that. They're not expensive. You can make, well, the lumber costs are high right now. You're probably better off buying one than making one. <laughs> you used to be able to make one for about $20, but eh, I think it's probably, probably tripled in price right now. But, um, but, but they are wor well worth the investment. And the reason bats are in decline is because of lack of, of habitat. So providing some habitat for them would be very helpful. And I think some people are afraid of them because the old Dracula movies, but 
really what what we learned in our class was that they carry very little disease, if any. And most of this is just fear mongering by people who probably have a business that, you know, uses something besides bats. <laughs> and so they, you know, put out negative information about them. But um, don't be afraid of them because they really are beneficial. And then the, the poop that they have is like gold for your garden. And right. <laughs> no, it's true. And, and they, yeah, it is fear mongering. It's misinformation that is spread. And, and they don't like people either. So it's not like they're ever going to pester you. Even if you're out at night, you can often see them flying, but they're not going to swoop down and, interrupt or disturb you know your uh, little sit in the yard <laughs> you know <laughs> or party or whatever you're having i would love to ask you um, now that you're living in a rural part of the country what was one of the most surprising things for you moving there and starting to live this this lovely uh more environmentally sound life Sure. Well, um, thinking back many, many years, I will say that one of the most jarring things to me was the quiet, having been raised in a, a very urban city of Chicago, uh, to move out into the country, which I fell in love with, but it was jarring at first and actually a little difficult to get to sleep or, um, you know, oh, those are crickets. You know, <laughs> What is that noise? <laughs> oh, crickets or, um, you know. Uh, cicadas. Cicadas were a new phenomenon to me that I knew nothing about. So um, yeah, actually, you know, dealing with the bugs was a bit challenging for me at first. So I, I educated myself very well, especially over the years on uh, what is a beneficial bug, what is a not beneficial bug, and how do I treat each one the best way. So that there was something um, other than that, I wouldn't trade it in, in a heartbeat. We are sort of suburban now rather than country, although we are on 15 acres, so it, we're still rural living within a suburban-like area, more so than we have before, so we're sort of a crossbreed. But uh, yeah, I, seeing the stars, the quiet, the air is so different. Um, There's a different lifestyle, I think, it is because even when I visit the city now for work or um, you know do travel tours, there is a sense of urgency and everything is kind of hurry up and go. Where in the country or even in the suburban areas, it is a much more relaxed, enjoyable for me. I think sort of lifestyle, and I, I would love to see urban areas begin to adopt that because they can. I don't think it has to be one or the other. I think you can thrive in the city or thrive in the country. I think we all need to find better ways to kind of chill, right? Relax and, and slow down and enjoy the pace of life and integrate nature with into our life. Even if we live in, you know, a 25 apartment complex or, or 100 apartment complex for that matter, if we're in the city, it could be more. Uh, there's still ways to bring nature back into our lives and it's so healthy for our environments for ourselves and for the world at large because every little bit just adds up oh i so agree and now we're kind of getting to the, the end of uh or to the end of our show but i'd love to hear what are some of the things you're doing right now that are some of your favorite things like are you canning or yeah planting something special or different or <laughs> nurturing kitty cats <laughs> that's my favorite uh right now i am loving we are in in full herb harvest mode because this is the time of year that basil and uh you know, all of my favorites. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm harvesting everything right now. Basil is a big one. Rosemary, thyme, uh, you know, cilantro is is just harvested a big crop of that. And now I'm letting it go into seed so that I can replant it because cilantro is one that's just keep replanting. Awesome, uh, prolific grower all season long. So this is herb season for me. This is big uh, drying utilizing the fresh herbs. I freeze quite a few of them, 
turning them into tinctures or essential oils for different various uses. That's that's what's going on in my world right now. And of course, it's the start of tomato and pepper season, which we're seeing. They're just they're just starting to come. Blackberries are almost here. I am super excited about that. <laughs> that is one of my favorite seasons. About two weeks, two weeks away, I think. They're turning red. So wow. that, that's what I'm up to on the garden level. It sounds absolutely divine. <laughs> So Barb, tell everybody uh, um, where they can get getting baked, everything you need to know about hemp, CBD, and, and medicinal gardening. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, Amazon is a click away if you want it. And uh, any bookstore, uh, we are international bookstores. And some exciting news I just found out two weeks ago that uh, the book is being made into audio. We just, um, yeah, we just got the audio rights um, sold. So that's going to be coming out here in a couple of weeks, I believe. So you can get ebook, audio, or hardcover through any any major book seller, even if you're at Target or Walmart or, you know, we're everywhere. <laughs> well, tell everybody your contact information and how they can get in touch with you if they if they so desire. <laughs> Absolutely, I love to talk, so. <laughs> um, and especially about plants. I'm happy to help anybody if you have any specific questions, can't get an answer somewhere, or just want some sage advice. Uh, I'll give you the best I can from my 30 years of experience, but I also talk to so many people, so I'm just a gatherer of information. And they can reach me at ruralmom.com, R-U-R-A-L-M-O-M.com, any of my social media channels. And if you want to email me, you can email me at barbweb at rowmom.com. And I'm, I'm happy to answer anybody's questions or just say hi or tell me your favorite product or plant. And, um, you know, we'll just have a chat. That sounds great. And I'm going to put Barb's information and links uh, below wherever we post this, this video so that you know, if you uh, if you need it, there it will be. And I, I think I'd like to have you on uh, periodically, Barb, to, to give seasonal updates and, <laughs> and tips for us because you're just such a wealth of information and joy. And uh, I know we can all use both of those. <laughs> Absolutely. Amen to that. Uh, <laughs> I would love to, Nancy. I absolutely love speaking with you. You are a wealth of information and joy as well. And we have a good synergy. So that's wonderful. Anytime I'd be happy to come on and chat with you and, you know, uh, talk about whatever topics. Yeah, seasonal is great. We'll have fall coming up and lots of things to do in fall with the gardening chores and uh, say right. what's what's going to go on in the winter right well we will connect and figure out our next show for all of y'all and um thank you so much barb for joining me today it's barb webb and uh, she is got the popular blog ruralmom.com and she's also a columnist for she savvy so i'll put the links below and um everyone out there just know that Barbara and I love you and thank you so much for joining us today and we know your time is valuable and we are honored for you to be with us and uh, so I'm Nancy Addison your host and as I close the show today I just want to say um, wherever you go whatever you do just remember to add that main ingredient and that main ingredient is always love Yeah. <laughs>